The previous talks in this series, whilst they've been about materialism and they've included a lot of ideas from physics, may seem far removed from anything to do with political economy or politics. I'm now going to be touching on something where the physicists have, are actually able to teach us something about how the economy works. What is it has been shown over the last 15-20 uh, years is that commodity relations themselves are governed by laws which are a, an offshoot of the laws of thermodynamics. That you can predict the distribution of wealth by it. The, you can show by physics reasoning that exploitation must exist. And there are also political implications because these arguments show that a utopian market socialism is in the end bound to move back towards capitalism. In my presentation of Boltzmann and Entropy, I gave examples in which only the positions of the molecules were being considered. And the entropy maximization just involved the reasoning about the spreading out of the positions of molecules. But his argument is actually about positions and velocities, or positions and energies. And he came up with formula for predicting the distribution of speeds and energies that molecules will have. The point is that entropy can be maximized, but it has to be maximized subject to the conservation laws of physics, that mass, momentum and energy must all be conserved in the process of entropy maximization. This gives rise to the Boltzmann distribution of energies, which shows that you have a relatively high probability of low energy states and a rapidly falling off probability of something being in a state as the energy goes up. If you consider the energies here to be, for instance, the energies of individual atoms or individual molecules in a gas, that the probability of getting very fast, highly energetic model, molecules falls off rapidly, falls off with a negative exponential function. If you plot it on a log-log scale, the Boltzmann distribution looks like this, a characteristic downward pointing curve. Now, commodity exchange itself is a random process. The interaction between molecules is random and at a large scale the operation of a market economy is random. Yakovenko, who was a Soviet trained physicist who had learned some political economy at university in Moscow where he had to read Capital, after the fall of the Soviet Union came to the West as a physicist and he applied some of his uh, skills in physics to analyzing how capitalist economies work and how money is distributed in these societies. He realized that the buying and selling of commodities is another random disorderly process. But this random disorderly process is also governed by a conservation law. Money is like energy. It's conserved and passed between buyers and sellers. Ordinary buyers and sellers are not allowed to print money. This idea that there's a conservation law operating in commodity exchange is, I think, also present in Marx's Capital. The first chapter of Capital is essentially arguing that value is something that's conserved in exchange. And there are approaches in Marx, certainly, 
to trying to explain capitalism by what he calls laws of motion, which is obviously a, a concept from physics. Now, what is the prediction that you get if you make this analogy between money and energy and assume that you have random interaction occurring, chaotic behavior in the market economy? Well, it follows that the distribution of money should also follow a Boltzmann distribution. Distribution of wealth should have a Boltzmann distribution. The first stage that uh, Yakovenko did was to construct a computer model of a capitalist economy in which you have random commodity exchanges and run this for a while and see what the distribution of money between people is in this process. And yes, in the simulated economy, you get the, the Boltzmann distribution. So the computer simulation appears to confirm the basic hypothesis. But what does this imply? It, it follows that there will be a few people with a lot of money and a lot of people with little money. It implies an uneven distribution of money. And this is just in petty commodity production, essentially. Just in commodity exchange. That's the distribution of money or wealth that it predicts will arise. Now, a prediction is all very well, but you always have to test it against reality. In fact, what he finds, and I've reproduced his graph for the UK, what he finds is that for more than 90% of the population, the distribution of their money or wealth holdings follows the Boltzmann distribution. This is the Boltzmann distribution and these are along the bottom axis the total amount of money or wealth people have in thousands of pounds. So people up to just over uh, maybe 150, 200,000 pounds, observations of that show a clear Boltzmann de Gibbs distribution. However, for the top 3% of the population, you get a different distribution. Instead of this downward curving distribution, you get a straight line. And this is called a Pareto distribution, after the Italian economist Pareto. What does this show? asks Yakovenko. It shows that Western society is a two-class society. The great majority of the population are along this curve. Their distribution of money is governed by the Boltzmann-Gibbs law. But the top 3% follow a completely different law. What does it actually mean? It means that there are people who are super wealthy. If you consider the curve of this Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution, it's going to come down here and there's almost going to be nobody with more than a million pounds. But that's not what we actually observe. You do get millionaires, you get billionaires. And they shouldn't exist if all you had is the random distribution of money that you would get in commodity exchange. Now, that uh, diagram of the graph shows it on log log space. If you do it in ordinary space, you can see that the Boltzmann distribution falls off more sharply than the Pareto distribution. The Pareto distribution shows that the top 3% get their income from something else, something which cannot be explained by commodity exchange. And basically, it's saying, and Yakovenko concludes, these are the people whose income comes from capital, whose income doesn't come from selling their labor or petty trading.
Now, why should it be different? Yakovenko's explanation is that if you earn income from capital, capital grows exponentially by compound interest. This violates the equivalent exchange that is involved in commodities and means that the owners of capital attain exp exponentially high levels of wealth compared to those who earn their income from exchange. Further work in this has been done by Ian Wright, who showed that if you add the buying and selling of labor power to a model of a market economy, then that will also give you the empirically observed distribution of income. You'll get a Boltzmann distribution for the majority of people who sell their labour power and a Pareto distribution for the capitalists. Um, Ian Wright's models also show that the law value arises as an emergent property of the, the random operation of the market. What political conclusions can we draw from this? Well, first is the philosophical conclusion that the same kind of materialist analysis that explains the movement of atoms will, when you apply it to capitalist society, explain the distribution of wealth. And this has implications for various forms of utopian socialism or utopian market socialism. Suppose you have a society set up in which there are no capitalists. There is just a mass of workers' cooperatives. And these cooperatives are producing for the market. What Yakovenko's work shows that the cooperatives themselves as agents exchanging commodities in the market will end up with the Boltzmann distribution of money, of cash. Many will have a little money and a few will have a lot of money. So inequality will necessarily be generated by the random operation of the market. And this is essentially the same argument that Marx gave against Proudhon in The Poverty of Philosophy, except it's expressed more precisely. Those cooperatives with a lot of money will either buy or subcontract labour from the poorer cooperatives, or they will lend them cash at interest. This means the richer cooperatives will grow even richer, and over time, you will re-establish the capitalist distribution of money. So, what appears initially to be something completely abstruse, the laws of thermodynamics, ends up having very real political implications. Very real political implications as a critique of utopian socialism. And essentially it says that a random market economy can never generate equality. It will immediately generate a Boltzmann distribution, which is already pretty unequal. And that will then accelerate via the buying and selling of labour power. So the methods of analysis that come from hard materialism actually have very real political implications.